Hey gang, in this class, you're going to get an introduction to color from multiple different disciplinary perspectives. I'm here to describe a little bit about how I see and think about color as a psychologist. Psychology is the study of mind, brain, and behavior. And so psychologists are interested in how color is processed in the brain and represented in the mind. This term, you'll be hearing from me about several processes in color vision through a psychological lens. The first of these is how light is converted into neural code, that is changed into a format that the brain can understand. Brains themselves can't see. Brains are just like juicy meatloaves. So all they can do is interpret a very specific set of electrochemical signals called action potentials. And in week four, we're gonna talk about how we go from the presence of light to action potentials, to that electrochemical code. But we're not just interested in translating information about light into the code of the brain. We're also interested in how we interpret that code. One of the fascinating things about our sensory systems, and we'll talk about this lots, is that when we go from a physical object out in space, that is what we call a distal stimulus, to a proximal stimulus, which is the energy that actually reaches our sensory receptors, um, we lose a ton of information. So there may be a rose out in the world, but the sensory receptors in our eyes aren't able to distinguish necessarily between a red rose in sunlight and a white rose under a red lamp. So one of the challenges that the visual system faces is making inferences, is making guesses about the likely source of what's out there in the world based solely on the weak and somewhat watered down proximal stimulus that we actually have access to. So one of the tools that psychologists like to use to discover things about the kinds of inferences we make about the processes by which we are guessing what's actually out there is through illusions. Psychologists are really interested in, in these inferences and illusions can be useful because they reveal what those inferences are. Given that the inferences are often made outside of conscious awareness, they only are exposed to us through the use of illusions. So illusions occur primarily because of mechanisms that normally provide the correct interpretation. That's why we use them. Mostly they're right. So we refer to these, uh, we refer to illusions as principled mistakes. They are errors in perceptual processing that reveal something important about normal visual processing. The fact that normally they help us means usually using those processes doesn't lead to errors. Okay, so here's an example. If you look at the central squares on the top and the side facing us, the top one appears to be brown and the one on the side facing us appears orangish. Yes? Okay. But if we cover up the rest of the surfaces with a dark mask, so you can't see anything except those two squares, you'll see that they are in fact the same. They're reflecting the same wavelengths of light. They are what we would call the same color. So why do we see them differently? It has to do with the inferences we're making. We assume that the one on top is brightly illuminated and the one on the side is in shadow. So we interpret the true color, what's actually out there. We make different guesses about the nature of the distal stimuli. This is a principled mistake because normally in shadow, things do appear darker than they are. So that bit of color correction is typically useful. So psychologists love illusions. We love them because they're fun, but more importantly, we love them because they allow us to differentiate between the world as it is and the world as we perceive it. When we are fooled, when perception does not match reality, that is a clue about how perceptual processes are working. This is why Purkinje called deception of the senses the truths of perception. So to summarize, the, the sources of information that psychologists are interested in, we've got the sensory input, the action potentials coming from the eyes heading up to the brain, the raw neural code that represents the proximal stimulus. We call that the bottom up input. We've also got our inferences based on experience and expectations, the guesses that we're making about what's out there, the way we go beyond the bottom up input. We refer to that as, the, as top down information. And both of these sources of information enable us to arrive at a perception. Finally, psychologists are also interested in how individuals differ from one another in how they perceive the world. So there's a wealth of research showing that we each walk in our own perceptual worlds. That is, what you perceive may be different from what I perceive. 
And these individual differences can be the result of individual differences in bottom-up processing. So for instance, in this class, we'll talk about different forms of color deficiency uh, and, and color blindness. Um, and because of top-down differences across individuals, that is like the assumptions we make about ambient lighting. So we'll talk about the processes that tend to be consistent across individuals and the ways in which we differ from one another. I want to end with a quote by Sir John Eccles. I want you to realize that there is no color in the natural world and no sounds, nothing of this kind, no textures, no patterns, no beauty, no scent. The world out there is synthesized in our consciousness. So as a psychologist, I'm interested in how the world out there gets in, that's the bottom-up processing, and how we synthesize that information in the mind. Thanks very much, and I'll see you in class.